I'm Nariman Farvardin, president of Stevens Institute of Technology. And today I'm pleased to have a conversation with Dr. Peter Norvik, director of research at Google. Good morning, Peter, and welcome to Stevens. Good morning, great to be here. Thank you very much for taking time from a very busy schedule to join us. We look forward to hearing your talk this afternoon, but I thought I would take advantage of this opportunity to ask you a few questions that I think thousands of people would be interested in hearing the answers to. We've all been hearing about artificial intelligence for many decades. And uh, over this period of time, there's been a lot of excitement and at times we've been led to believe that we are on the verge of a breakthrough. In the past several years, there's been a surge of uh, interest in artificial intelligence and machine learning again. Do you believe that this time it's different? If you look at the press, it's always a cycle of bust and boom because they've got to write something. And so either they've got to write this is a new big thing or they've got to write it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. From the inside, it looks more like steady progress. But it certainly is true that it's a very exciting time now. And the, the past few years, we have seen a lot of breakthroughs. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. One is when we do machine learning, we rely on data. And there's just so much more available now that the world is coming online, the, the internet, and everything's being captured digitally. And that can feed into computers. They can learn from it. And so they capture more than they ever did before. And that, that allows us to have new capabilities. Secondly, computers keep getting faster. And I remember when I was in graduate school, tried out some techniques and ran them uh, overnight and didn't work and you ran them till the next day and it still didn't work and then you just give up and say, I guess that technique didn't work. And now the computers we have are up to 100 million times faster, right? So I didn't have time to uh, run for 100 million days back then, uh, but now we can do that much more. And so things that failed a decade ago, two decades ago, now we can routinely run and we get better answers just because we have more computation available. And of course, there always are breakthroughs. There's new papers, new techniques, and, and so on. But I think the data and the computation are what's powering more of this than the breakthroughs in the algorithms. And therefore, you're predicting that this time it's somewhat different. Yeah, it is somewhat different. And I think a lot of it is reaching a useful threshold, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been following the, the field of speech recognition for 20 years, and it kept on being not useful, right? So 20 years ago, you could get a, a dictation program, and you could train it on your personal voice and use it, but it was annoying. And so unless you had a, a very specific need, you wouldn't bother doing it. But now everybody's talking to their phones and it mostly works. And you only need a couple percent improvement every year to pass that threshold from not being useful to suddenly being useful. And now a whole new area has opened up. Speech recognition is a great example. I, when I was younger myself, I used to work in that field. So I fully appreciate the advancements that we've made in that particular field. Can you think of other uh, simple examples like speech recognition in which machine learning has had a profound impact in uh, the progress that's been made? Image recognition is another one. So taking pictures and, and saying what's in that. And there's lots of applications for that. You know, people taking more and more photos now as they're carrying cameras and phones with them. And how do you organize them all? Mm -hmm. I used to have to go through and put keywords on them and organize them into folders. Now I just dump them into an algorithm and it does the labeling for me automatically. You know, I can search for New York skyline and it finds them all or sunset or individual people and they're all automatically recognized and retrieved. So that's great from a personal point of view and this image processing capability also allows us to do lots of other things. We're on the verge of getting self-driving cars out to the public, it's still kind of a research project, but in order to do that you have to see the world and make sense of it. And that's getting to the point now where it's practical and just a few years ago it wasn't. I'm actually going to get back to the self-driving car uh, and related topics in a second. But we talked about artificial intelligence and we spoke about machine learning. Could you use a, a simple language to describe the relationship between AI and machine learning? I guess the way I think of it is uh, artificial intelligence is the art of uh, programming when you don't know what to do. And so it deals with uh, an uncertain world rather than a certain one. So regular programming is like, 
I want to balance my checkbook, and we know exactly what the answer is. The withdrawals have to equal the deposits and so on. And artificial intelligence is for something when you don't know how to do it. So how do I recognize a face? So I can recognize all my friends' faces, but I don't know how I do it. And in order to figure out how to do that, that's artificial intelligence. Now, one way you can uh, achieve artificial intelligence is through machine learning, which says rather than having a programmer sit down and scratch their head and think really hard about step by step how is this achieved, you just show the system a bunch of examples and it learns from that. So the job of the human in the loop is not a programmer who's saying how to do it, but rather a teacher saying this is what I want you to achieve, here's some examples, and then the machine learns how to do the task. In the earlier part of the conversation, you spoke about the advancements in computing power and the advancements in availability of data, large, large amounts of data, as the two main contributors to the recent advancements in, in AI. Well, compute power is available to a lot of organizations and a lot of people and a lot of companies. Uh, data is not necessarily available to the same extent, but at Google, you're in a very enviable position in that you have access to tremendous amounts of data. Can you tell us a little bit about the role artificial intelligence or machine learning is playing at Google in developing your products? So it's everywhere at Google, uh, right? So, so some of the places it's very visible. You can speak your queries now. Uh, we can label the photos and so on. And so there are applications that uh, could only be done with uh, machine learning, with artificial intelligence. Uh, translation is another example. You give us text in one language and we'll translate it to the other. And, and it went from being so-so to, to being pretty good uh, over the course of a few years. And those are all visible applications that the user can see that couldn't be done without this technology. But behind the scenes, there's also continued improvements uh, sort of everywhere. Uh, so you do a search, you get some search results, and over time, those results get better because we have a combination of human programmers and machine learning to figure out how to understand the pages and your queries better and give you better results. I want to go back to the question of driverless cars and similar topics. Uh, this is a, an issue that has received a lot of attention from the public. A lot of people are worried about uh, many, many people losing their jobs. There are predictions that sometime down the line, maybe in the next couple of decades, the number of drivers will be 80% smaller than it is today. Uh, so I'd like to you hear your thoughts about this particular application and your predictions but broaden the answer and tell us, uh, in your opinion, what would be the role of automation in our society in the years to come? Will it have a profound impact, for example, on uh, employment? So we are seeing some uh, shifts and, and disruptions, uh, some of that because of uh, automation, some of it just because of computerization and communication in general that, uh, I mean, we're already seeing taxis getting displaced because uh, you can press a button on your phone and have a car show up. And that's uh, not automation, that's communication, is yes. now we can make a marketplace between the drivers and, uh, and the people who want to ride, whereas before we didn't have the technology to make that marketplace. And that's true whether the car that ar arrives has a driver in it or not. There is a possibility of, uh, of not having a driver. Uh, I think in the next decade or so, we're not going to see a lot of displacement of drivers because they're still very useful. There's, there's things they can do. And uh, you, know, you may see automation part of the time. And so a uh, truck driver may be able to go longer hours because they're sleeping part of the time while the truck is dr driving itself. Uh, but you still have to load and unload and sign papers and do the, all these other things. And so I don't think you'll have trucks without any driver at all for, for a very long time. You'll just see them being more productive. And in general, uh, I see this trend of this technology allows society to be more productive, so there'll, there'll be more wealth to go around, but there'll be some disruption and some of the jobs will change. And you see a wide range of predictions for how many jobs are uh, subject to automation. And of course it feels scary to say 
my job might disappear, and it's easy to imagine a job disappearing, and it's hard to imagine the new jobs that are going to appear, because they don't exist yet. Uh, and they will, and that's always happened, right? So we, we transition from most workers being farmers to most workers not being farmers, and we found something for them to do. But if I was a farmer 100 years ago, and you told me uh, your job's gonna disappear, and I said, what are my grandchildren gonna do? And if you told me uh, they're gonna sit in the tall office building at a desk for eight hours a day, I would've said, oh, come on. No, nobody could do that. that doesn't, that's not a real job. Uh, but that's what happened. And something will happen in the future. We can't quite see it. And there'll be some uh, disruption and anxiety when we make the transition. Uh, but there's still lots of things for people to do. And lots of uh, additional wealth will be added. We talked about driverless cars. And as I said earlier, it's receiving a lot of attention. You, you read a lot about what's happening, uh, you read about Uber's um, activities in uh, making sure that Uber cars can be driven by machines as opposed to human beings. Are there other sectors of the economy that uh, you believe machine learning will have um, similar uh, applications in the financial sector, maybe healthcare or the like? It's hard to predict, especially the future. Uh, I, I think those are, are good applications. Uh, I think in general, kind of customer support, you'll, you'll see uh, a change. And, we, and we've already had that to some degree, where uh, now a lot of things you, you go to the web rather than going to a person and you, you get the information you need. You didn't have to talk to someone on the phone because uh, the information was all there. And now I think we'll see more of that, uh, but it will be more personalized rather than me going to a company website and searching and figuring out the answer to my problem, I'll just have a conversation. Say, hey, this isn't working for me. Can you help me? And some of those conversations will be handled automatically by a machine learning system. And if it doesn't quite work, I may get shifted over to a, a human operator uh, the way I do now. Of course, now it's, it's really annoying when you get into one of those uh, phone tree systems and it doesn't quite understand you and it gives you options and none of the options are quite right, I think it'll feel much more natural when you can have a conversation rather than uh, press two to, to do such and such. Incidentally, it's also equally annoying when you speak with somebody who doesn't know his or her job. That's right. <laughs> that right. happens too. Yeah, right. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, the advantage of machine learning is you learn once and then every interaction from then on has that knowledge. Yes, exactly. Where, whereas with a, a human, you know, some of the operators may be very good and trained, uh, but you get, if you get a new one who doesn't have that knowledge, uh, they can't share all the knowledge uh, between them the way you can with a machine learning system. One other semi-technical question. We hear terms such as supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, uh, can you shed some light on, uh, on these uh, terms? Yeah, so, uh, so those are the three major uh, ways we think about the process. And so, so all learning is, is uh, we show the system some examples and it learns from that. Supervised learning is where uh, we show it an example and we show it the right answer. So we say, here's a picture, uh, this is a cat. Uh, here's another picture, this is a dog, show you lots of examples, and now I give you a new picture you've never seen before, and the computer can say, I think that's a cat. Mm -hmm. Unsupervised is when we don't give you the right answer. We just say, uh, you know what, it's too hard for me to go through all these pictures and tell you one by one what the answer is, but here's just a big pile of a million pictures, and ask the computer, now you sort them out. And so what it can do is say, well, these all look similar, so I'm gonna put them in one pile, and these look similar, I'm gonna put them in one pile. And now it's got a pile of cats, and it's gonna have another pile of dogs, but it doesn't know their names, because all we showed them was a picture. But it's able to say, uh, these are commonalities, and does that in an unsupervised way, where we didn't have to tell it the right answer. So it's the clustering that takes the place in that case. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, we prefer that because we don't have to go to the trouble of teaching and applying the labels or the correct answers to each one. Often we combine the two, where we say, we'll start off with unsupervised, make all these clusters, and then we'll do a small amount of supervised where we help it out 
and say, you know, this cluster here, we call that cat. Mm -hmm. this, this cluster we call dog. Now, reinforcement learning is like when you do re reinforcement for your pets and you say, good dog or no. Uh, so we're not telling it the right answer, but we're just saying, are you headed in the right direction? And we often use that for things like uh, game playing, uh, where we play a game of chess or a game of Go, and it's hard to say, was this the right move or not? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd need a, an expert to study very carefully to say, uh, yes or no, this was the right move, or here was a better move. But it's very easy to say, hey, you know what? You won that game, and you lost this game. And so that's a reward signal appears at the very end of the game rather than for each individual move. But if you play enough games, then the system can work back and say, I got this reward, I know somewhere I lost the game, so I must have done something wrong somewhere along the way. If it's just one game, I can't go very far. But after I've done millions of games, start to see the patterns and say, aha, here's where I must have gone wrong. Interesting. So I'm assuming reinforcement learning is particularly helpful when you want to teach a machine how to play a game and well, master it? So anything where there's a series of steps and you don't know if the individual steps have gone right, uh, but at the end uh, there's a reward of some kind. So is there a particular application that comes to mind that gives you a natural uh, use for reinforcement learning? So playing games would be one. Uh, you could think of uh, things like uh, navigation mm -hmm. with, with self-driving cars, and of course there's supervised and unsupervised parts to how to do the self-driving car, but you could say, if I make these series of moves, uh, is that right? Or, you know, you're taking a ride at the end, you get a chance to rate your driver, right? And you say, five stars, that was a great ride. Or, you know, one star, it was too mm -hmm. bumpy. Yes. And then next time the system can say, okay, I'll try to be uh, smoother. In, in the way I accelerate or corner or whatever. Interesting. I guess we're running out of time. I'd like to ask you one other question that a lot of people uh, ask me when it comes to artificial intelligence and uh, its future and its impact on society, and that's the ethics of artificial intelligence. I'm sure uh, you've thought about this and you've had lots of discussions. Tell us about the ethical aspects of AI. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, a big question. We, we think about it all the time. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like AI in technology meets philosophy. And the reason it comes up is uh, because we're teaching these systems. Instead of telling them uh, how to do something step by step, we're saying, here's some examples and here's what we want to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the goal, here's the reinforcement, this is good and this is bad, here's what we want to optimize. And so now we have to think exactly what is it that we want to optimize. And that's where the ethics comes in. That we have to say, here's the good. Are we only trying to make profit for the company? Well, that doesn't seem very ethical. Uh, what are our responsibilities to our customers? How do we achieve uh, fairness? So, uh, for example, let, let's go back to the uh, speech recognition. Uh, so say I've got a speech recognizer and it's pretty good, but I want to make it better. And my goal is to uh, optimize the average accuracy over all users. Mm -hmm. And uh, say I discover, uh, well, one thing I could do is work very hard on one group of speakers who have the same sort of uh, speech patterns. And, but I only have enough time to do that for one group. Now, am I going to do that for the majority group, the largest group, or am I going to do it for a minority, mm. smaller group? And if I want to achieve the maximum good over all people, then I'm going to choose the majority group because that's going to do the most overall good. It's not like I'm prejudiced against a minority. It's just my goal was to get the highest average, and that's the way to achieve the highest average. But that means that those who happen to be in the minority group, whatever it is, their accent is unusual or their vocal cords are different in some way, they're not going to get the, the same amount of attention. And we have to decide is that fair? Is that what we're trying to do? Did we really want to uh, maximize overall people, or should we say there are some protected groups who deserve equal uh, attention, even if they have a smaller number of members? And there's questions like this that come up all the time, because we're telling the computer to optimize what we want, but in order to do that, we have to figure out what is it that we want. Indeed. 
very, very interesting problems created by technology and hopefully solved by technology in the future. Dr. Norvik, this was a most interesting session. I want to thank you for joining us today at Stevens and I look forward to uh, your talk this afternoon. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you.